Good morning, and welcome to Nasagoya Presbyterian Church's online Zoom worship service. So glad you've joined us for our 185th anniversary Sunday. We begin today with our We Are the Church series. We are the church, the body of our Lord. We are all God's children. We have been restored. My name is Brittany Schrader. And my name is Penny Schrader. And my name is Catherine McMillan. And I've been coming to Nasagawea all my life. And I've been coming to Nasagawea all my life. And I have been coming to Nasagawea all my life, which makes me the oldest member of Nasagawea Church. Collectively, we have been coming to Nasagawea for 173 years. I started coming to Nasagawea because of my parents. And I started coming to Nasagawea because of my parents. And I started coming to Nasagawea because of my parents. A meaningful moment in my own faith journey was attending Sunday school at Nasagawea and learning about the different stories in the Bible. And in particular, one teacher who was special to me was Betty Johnson. A meaningful moment for me was when I joined the church as a teenager. And a meaningful moment for me was when I was taking classes uh, before I became a member as we had to reflect on our faith journey so far. A memorable moment for me was for the day that Don and I got married. And when Rob and I got married and hopefully when Brad and I get married. But until then, one of my most significant memorable moments is becoming a member at the church in front of the congregation I grew up with. The words I would use to describe NPC are joyful and friendly. And inclusive and part of my extended family and everyone has a warm welcome and very supportive to all. My favorite scripture is 1 Corinthians verse 13, the way of love. And my favorite book of the Bible is actually Genesis. And my favorite story is the Christmas story. What I miss most about the congregation since this pandemic is actual personal conversations. I miss the chatting with everyone and the light lunches and coffee after church. And I miss socializing and catching up with people at the church or Charlene's candies because she always has to put up with us sitting behind her. When we meet again, I am looking forward to all the special gatherings held throughout the year. And I am looking forward to seeing smiles and people without masks. And I'm looking forward to hopefully getting married and being the fourth generation to do so, just like my sister. My favorite hymn is Lord I Lift Your Name on High. And my favorite hymn is the Lorica. And my favorite hymn is the Church's One Foundation, which it means the cornerstone of the church. We are the church. We are the church. The body of our Lord. Let us sing together. We've got three favorite hymns to fit into our service today. So we're going to begin with the Lorica. The 
Thank you to uh, Penny and uh, Brittany and Catherine for that wonderful We Are the Church this morning. Let's uh, come together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have been so faithful to us for so many years. On this anniversary Sunday, we think about all the ways that you have walked with this community of faith for 185 years, guiding, providing, uh, strengthening, and encouraging for the work that you have for this church. Yet God, sometimes we get stuck. We get stuck in the past. We get uh, in a rut. And we stop listening to your words, your spirit, guiding us forward. And we think that uh, nothing, will, uh, nothing will change from how it is. And when it does, we are dismayed and anxious and resistant. God, we ask in this time of worship that you would soften each of our hearts as we read your scripture and, and hear about both the past and the future of Nasagawea, that you would open us up to visions of the future. 
that each of us would experience the, the change that comes with your Holy Spirit, making us new, recreating us into the body of Christ. And so we ask you pour out your spirit on each of us that we would be transformed into love and grace. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we have a, a fun uh, song for you to sing together. It's got some actions. And this is Brittany's favorite hymn. Let's sing together. Lord, I lift your name on high. We now move to our time of uh, giving thanks and sharing some photos from the past. Uh, so I think what we'll do is we'll watch the video and then uh, we'll have a prayer together uh, of thanksgiving and offering. Let's enjoy seeing Nasagoya Presbyterian Church then and now. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you've given us so much for so many years. And your promise is that you will always be faithful to this congregation. And give thanks for all the ways people have given uh, for so many years um, to ensure that there is uh, a Christian witness in this community. People who have sacrificed so much, people who have given so many hours uh, and their, uh, their energy uh, to the work of your church. We thank you for those who continue even now to follow in that tradition, 
uh, to uh, give generously, uh, to share their gifts and skills, and to uh, come together Sunday after Sunday to be your church. We ask you to bless all the gifts that have been given uh, in this uh, anniversary year, and we ask that you would uh, bless the givers. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. And I'd like to invite uh, David Blake to lead us in our scripture readings this morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? And Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. And as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, that everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, then God has given to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Dave. Well, it's anniversary Sunday. And on anniversary Sunday, we often look back like we have done. And yet today, we're going to also finish our sermon series, The Future Church looking ahead. But you know the old saying, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. So today we are going to look back as we look forward at the same time. And to begin, I'd like us to look yet again uh, this week all the way back to the early church to find out where we as the church have been. And my hope is that we are going to find yet another characteristic or mark of the early church that will again be crucial to our own future as the church. So we go to the story of Acts and we find Peter. But this is not the same bold Peter we knew from last week in chapter 4. No, this is a chapter 11 Peter. Not a bankruptcy Peter. No, uh, a chapter 11 Peter is a Peter who is humble because chapter 11 Peter experienced a change back in chapter 10 and he will never be the same again. Now your question is probably, Reuben, what happened in chapter 10? That sounds like an important chapter. Why aren't we reading that chapter? And you're welcome to go and read that chapter for yourself. It's excellent. But for now, I don't have to tell you what happened in chapter 10 because Peter tells us the whole story all over again in chapter 11. And, and get this, chapter 11 is not 
even the last time that Peter gets to tell his story of chapter 10. In chapter 15, in Acts, Peter again relays to others in the church the story of his change of heart and what it means for the church. And so really, uh, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 15 are all part of one larger story. And it's the story of the first major change in the church. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Change. Let's have a look at Peter and the change that came over him. So here's how Peter begins his story. I was praying. Peter's story of change starts with prayer. Truly, all stories of change, whether intentionally or not, start with a prayer. Now, I don't know if Peter was praying specifically for change. We don't know what he was praying about, but we do know from our own experience of prayer that when we are living in a world that is deeply hurting, when we're living in a place of discomfort and longing, when we're living in situations that, that have us asking, where do we go from here? That is when we find ourselves on our knees in prayer. And out of that lamentation, whether we know it or not, comes this deep desire for a change. We may not know exactly what that change will look like. We may not even think that things can change. But change always starts with an ache inside us, an ache that leads us to prayer. Now, I believe the church is in that place of discomfort and longing and hurting and aching and asking that question, where do we go from here? This is uh, certainly related to the pandemic and our struggle to do the ministry that we've been called to. But, you know, the ache has been there long before the pandemic, that ache in the church. It's a, an ache related to uh, conflicts over racism and homophobia and sexism. It's related to uh, our national church's dwindling numbers and the increased costs of maintaining our buildings as well as society's perceived irrelevance of the church. You know, we, were, uh, we had a gathering of the Guelph Line churches where we invited members from each church to come and speak, and, and you could hear the aching, a sense that, that things are not as they could be or should be. Now, my hope is that like Peter, that, that that aching that we have would drive us to pray. Because that, that is the first step. Just like Peter's story begins with, I was praying. My hope is that when we look back at the positive changes that occur in our future, that we will tell our story beginning with those words. We were praying. Because only by putting himself in a position of prayer was Peter able to receive God's vision of change. And only by putting ourselves in that same position will we be able to sense what God is doing for the future church. But prayer is just the beginning of Peter's story. Next, Peter gets an invitation. And as Peter tells it, three men showed up at his door and invited him to go with them. And so prompted by the Holy Spirit, he chooses to go. Now, this is a big step for Peter because the men who have showed up are not like him. They are Gentiles. And all his life, Peter has never associated with Gentiles because Gentiles were considered unclean. And as Peter reports in his dream, he's never done anything or considered unclean before. But the road to change is asking Peter, and it's asking us, 
to re-examine that, that phrase that we love so much in the church. We've never done it that way before. But what I'm getting at here is that this wasn't just any old invitation for Peter. It was an invitation to something new, an invitation to, to do things differently, an invitation for Peter to be uncomfortable in his own skin, an invitation for him to suspend his pre-judgment. And that's not easy for Peter or for any of us to do. Oh, we may, we may not like the current situation that we are in, but it's all we know. And when it's all we know, it's hard to leave something behind and reach for something we don't know about yet. Peter needed three reiterations of the vision and a push from the Holy Spirit before he was prepared to venture into the unknown and travel with these Gentiles. We hate being uncomfortable too, but the Spirit sometimes, for the sake of change, asks us to sit in that discomfort and to wait for what is to be revealed. Hey, you know, I've been wondering lately, what invitations is the Spirit extending to us today? You know, in, in light of the 215 unmarked graves, what invitation to discomfort is the Spirit extending to the church? In the light of the Muslim family murdered in London, what invitation to discomfort is the spirit extending to the church. Now, in, in light of this week's General Assembly, hearing the hurt and harm that was done to LGBTQI persons, what invitation to discomfort is the spirit extending? Because if we're not willing to, first, put ourselves in a position of prayer, but second, put ourselves like Peter in a position of discomfort, and accept the invitation of the Spirit. That change that we yearn for and pray for will never come for the future church. Peter's story doesn't end there. Peter does accept the invitation. And he goes with the men and arrives at the house of Cornelius, who is a centurion. And Cornelius tells Peter of this vision that he had where an angel told him to find a man named Simon called Peter and invite him to come and speak. And I just want to pause there to just say something comforting for all of us who fear accepting the invitation to discomfort. Long before Peter accepted his invitation, God had already been working in hearts and minds, preparing for a change. Now, when we accept uh, the invitation to be uncomfortable, we can know that God has already gone ahead of us, preparing the way for change. Anyway, so, so Peter speaks, and he starts to speak, and he sees the Holy Spirit fall upon all those who are gathered, just like he had seen when he and the other disciples experienced it at Pentecost. And Peter has this personal change of heart because of it. And, and thank God that he did, because if it weren't for Peter's change of heart, none of us gathered here today would know the love and grace of Jesus Christ, because we are all Gentiles all outsiders. And somewhere along the line, someone accepted an invitation to change so that our ancestors might know God. But, but here's the thing. It is not enough that Peter changed. It's not enough that the six others who were witnesses on that day changed with him. None of it would have made a difference if they didn't proceed to change the rest of the church. 
And this is why I chose to read chapter 11 today rather than chapter 10. You know, they both tell the same story of change, but chapter 11 tells the story not just of Peter's change, but how Peter's change changed others. Do you remember how the story today started? Why Peter was telling his story in the first place? It was because people were criticizing him. People who didn't want change were criticizing Peter saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? See, they, they hadn't experienced what Peter had experienced. And when it comes to change, many are resistant, including us. And that's painstakingly true in the church. And if you read through the rest of Acts and the letters of Paul, you're going to find over and over again that it took the church a while to get its head around such a thing as a Gentile follower of Christ. In fact, uh, Peter and Paul were not just criticized for their views, they were persecuted for their change of heart. Change doesn't come easy to the church. So Peter has his first encounter with this resistance at the beginning of chapter 11, and it's not going to be the last time. But you know, instead of backing down, instead of just keeping his change of heart to himself, instead of keeping the peace, and maintaining status quo, Peter chooses to share his story. And you know, I find it interesting that when Peter shares his story, he doesn't try and convince his fellow disciples that God had granted the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles using Old Testament scripture. You know, he could have gone back to scripture easily. He had already preached at Pentecost from the prophet Joel, saying that the Spirit would be poured out on all people. He could have quoted from the prophet Isaiah about a light shining in the dark to Gentiles. He doesn't grasp for those texts right away. He instead tells the story of real people, real people who clearly had the spirit of God living in them. And that experience that he had of real people reminded him of something that Jesus had said. John baptized with water, but we would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, Peter's change and the change of the Gentiles is not his own work. It was the spirit who changed. And it's hard to argue with the Spirit of God. And so when we experience personal change in our lives through prayer, through invitation, and through witness of God's Spirit working, God calls us, like Peter, to live into that change. So that it's not just our own lives that that get changed, but the body of Christ is changed and it can grow and we can do that together. And in Peter's case, the, the church did, the, the criticizers were silenced, but more than that, they weren't just silenced, they rejoiced and praised God, that God's love was even greater than they had imagined. What a wonderful story of the church, the church's first big change and how it came to know God and, and know God's love uh, and what it means for welcoming others. And that's not the last change that we have experienced as the church. Change has continued for 2,000 years. We've changed in our understanding of Jesus, our understanding of God as three in one, in our understanding of creation, sin, and redemption, vocation, and sacrament, in our understanding of uh, women and race and gender and other religions, in our understanding of mission and ministry 
and justice and governance, we have even changed our understanding of change. And the most significant for us as a church, uh, most significant change as part of the reform tradition that we have experienced was the Reformation in the 1500s, where the motto of the church then was reformed and always reforming. And that's the idea that the church is always in the process of reformulating our faith for our time and context. Some people like to say, God never changes. But what we often forget is that while God might not change, our ideas about God do. We're always and should always be coming to a greater understanding of God's love, both as individuals and as the church, reformed and always reforming, changed and always changing. This was the mark of the early church, a church willing to be transformed, reformed, recreated into something new. It hasn't always <laughs> been a mark of the church through the centuries. Sometimes the church has been very resistant to change. But if the church wants to follow where God is leading, change is going to have to be a mark of this church, the church of the future. Praying for change, open to the Spirit's invitation to change, and willing to work to make that change a reality. Now, if I may, just to close off here, I want us to look back into Nasagoya's own history of change, just for some inspiration for all of us this morning and some inspiration for our future. Uh, back when Nasagoya was a two-point charge with St. David's, there was an ache in the congregation. Now, the old way of being the church wasn't working anymore, and the future was uncertain for Nasagoya. Would there be a future for this tiny church on the hill. And in that time of uncertainty, you know what this congregation did? Did what Peter did. It prayed. People gathered, right, where I am in this photo, right here in the sanctuary, to pray. And out of that time of prayer, they heard the Spirit. An invitation from God was extended to, to, for Nasegway to step into the unknown, into a place of discomfort, a place that would require great sacrifice. But with great faith, they accepted that invitation. And it changed this church into the church that it needed to be for this community and for the future. And since that time, the, the congregation has been living into that future, demonstrating great generosity and love and service to the community. Who knew that at that point in time when they were praying, who knew that this church would still be here so many years later? God did. And by God's grace and the leading of the Holy Spirit, it will be here for many more, changed and always changing. Amen. As we approach uh, the table for communion, uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna save the song for, uh, for during communion, Catherine. The, uh, I invite you now to gather the different elements that you have, um, bread and cup and have them prepared let us begin with an invitation. It's kind of going to reverse. We'll do the invitation first and then the prayer. <laughs> this is the table of the Lord. And it's God's will that those who love God and want to love God more would meet here together and eat this meal in the presence of Christ. And in eating this meal, 
that we would be transformed. And so I invite all of you that have an ache, all of you who have prayed for change, all of you who uh, um, long for something new. God is inviting you to sit and to eat and to be transformed, made into the likeness of Christ. This invitation is for all, young and old, as the Spirit we know it. Prophet Joel prophesied it would be poured out on all. And so all are welcome to this table to experience God's presence, to experience Christ's love, and to experience the Spirit's power. So come and let us eat this meal together. Let us pray. God, creator, out of nothing, you changed this world into something. You made it beautiful with growth and life. Out of dirt, you, you changed it into people. Air, you changed into life. And you continued to walk with your people, calling them to something new. We thank you that you called to Abraham to leave his home and to follow where you would lead, that indeed he would be the father of many nations and a blessing to all nations. We feel that blessing today. We thank you for the change you made through Moses, liberating your people from slavery and calling them to something new in a promised land, a new way of living. We thank you for your prophets who when your people became stubborn and refused to change would, would call your people to follow again the leading of your spirit. And God, we thank you for the change that you have made in our lives through Jesus Christ, who came into this world teaching and healing and loving your people. We thank you for the change that he has made in so many lives and especially our own. We thank you for the transformation we've experienced through grace and love. And God, we thank you for your spirit that continues to guide the church through the many ups and downs of this life. And we ask now in this time that on this bread and on this cup that you would pour out your spirit, that we'd be able to taste and see the new thing that you are doing in our world, that you would give us a new vision as we we take this meal that binds us together as one body and that we be able to be the future church. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you now to uh, take the bread and the cup. And when we take these elements, we tell the story that story that really changed everything of how Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples 
This is my body broken for you. Take and eat and remember me. And we remember how he took a cup later that evening and said, this cup is the new covenant. There is a change coming. No more sacrifices, no more uh, punishment and wrath, but God's love. Take, drink, and remember me. So following Christ's words, church, for many years, although we've changed how we do it <laughs> and the words that we say and how we think about it, yet this one thing remains the same for us. So let us take and eat with all those at this communion time, communion with the saints and communion with Christ. Let us taste and see that God is good. And while we do that, uh, we will uh, sing and listen to eat this bread. Let us pray. God, for this meal, for those gathered here, for those who've come before, we give you thanks. And we ask that you would enable us, encourage us, and empower us by your Holy Spirit to live lives transformed. In Christ's name, amen. Our closing hymn today is uh, the favorite of Catherine, the church, the church's one foundation. Let us sing together.
And now, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and through all the changes and all God's people said together, Amen. Thank you so much for coming to worship this morning. God bless.